Thanks. Uh, and so I'm very grateful to Russell Campbell, uh, the director of HIV AIDS uh, Office of Network Coordination, and um, Brian Minalgo, the deputy director, who will now be presenting to them about their role and, and how that can perhaps relate to uh, community involvement in HIV cure research. Thank you. Let's go. All right. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hi. So can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So my name is Russell Campbell. I see some familiar faces. I don't know who's online. So hello to those of you uh, that we may know. Um, my name is Russell Campbell. I'm the director of the Office of HIV AIDS Network Coordination. And with me today is... Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Minalga, deputy director of Hank. Um, great to see a lot of familiar faces. And maybe we can make up some time, too. This is mostly an informal kind of good to know you session. So, um, yeah, back to Russell. OK. Just giving some instructions here. Just a second. Um, I might have time. I'm not sure. Should we just use the arrows? There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, I'm trying to advance and it's not. There we go. All right. So we are delighted that we were invited to participate today. And that's one of the reasons we're here. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, we're here to listen, to learn, uh, and we'd like to share some of what we know. Uh, we've heard uh, just a, a bit about community engagement, and we do have uh, quite a bit of experience in terms of community engagement with a lot of the working groups that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. And, you know, I think we're all here because of HIV and other health disparities that impact us, our communities, and other individuals that we know globally. So, you know, we're here because there are issues that need to be addressed. And we want to do what we can to support the CURE agenda. So we thought it would be important to, you know, really help us uh, center ourselves and to think about why we do this work. For some of us, it's very personal. I think for probably most of us in this room, this is not just about a paycheck. We do this because we're passionate about this work. Um, there are two individuals that I often think about um, that have participated on some of our working groups who are no longer with us physically. Uh, David Hughes and Ray Ullman, some of you may have known these individuals. They were part of our um, Hank family. And there may be other people who you think about when you do this work during those times when it may be frustrating, when things are difficult just to recall why we do this work. So just pause for a moment, if you would, to think about why you do this work and, and just bring those people into the space as we, as we, as we carry on um, for the next few minutes that we're with you. So we are a small but mighty team of seven. Um, uh, I'd like for uh, maybe Pedro and Jeff, if they could stand, they're part of our Hank team. Uh, Pedro Gokachea and, yeah, and Dr. Jeffrey Shouten. Uh, Dr. Jeff Shouten, some of you may know, is the uh, previous director at Hank, who just retired recently. And so he's on as a consultant and, and has been a wonderful mentor to me over the, over the past few months and past couple of years, actually. So, and the rest of the team is not here with us, but this is our team. Some of you may be aware that uh, Hank has been around for a bit. We've been around since 2004. And the focus of Hank is about cross-network harmonization and collaboration. So when I started uh, with Fred Hutch uh, 15 years ago, there were six networks. Now there are four. So when we think about all of the activities that the networks are involved in, it's important to think about how do we look at making sure that there are these connections, there's harmonization to reduce duplication, all of those efforts, that's what we do at Hank. And Brian, I'm gonna see if you wanna to speak to this slide, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So this just kind of goes into what Russell was just talking about, the evolution of our clinical trials networks. 
Um, Hank came into the picture in 2004, as Russell just stated. So you can just kind of see this is originally from AVAC, this image, um, but just the evolution of our clinical trials networks, starting with the six networks and then, you know, moving down to our current um, seven year cycle. The networks operate on a seven year funding cycle from, um, from NIH. And so currently we have the four networks, uh, which I think we have on the next slide as well. But just to reiterate that, Hank is here to work across all four of the networks. Um, so, you know, we're not just focused on any one particular issue in HIV clinical research. Uh, but yeah, Russell, maybe you want to go to the next or yeah, I can sure. do that too. And yeah, so for the networks that we currently work with, I think um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with these, these networks. And I do want to call out too that in addition to these networks, we do have uh, external partners that we work with. And I, I, I see our NMAC uh, partners in the room. So I want to give a shout out to NMAC and, and AVAC here, of course. <laughs> so, um, so you see us as the, the, the hub there. So we'll, you'll have a little better sense of kind of how we do this uh, in terms of these connections. So we have their laboratory activities, their all these different activities that happen through the various working groups. And we do that through, um, through calls, through, um, through meetings. So we have clinics, we have labs. This is all we do. And it's really uh, you know, quite, quite the network of, of connections that we have. And um, just wanted to just highlight this for those of you who may not be as familiar with our work. So this gives you some idea of, of um, our coordination area, so we have cross-network coordination, so there's leadership, communications, evaluation, and lab, there are quite a few groups, behavioral social sciences, and then under community is probably where we're going to spend most of our time today. And so over the, so we talk about, so we've talked about community engagement a bit uh, this morning, what we've heard. Um, these are the groups here where we, when we talk about community uh, engagement, these are the groups that we really want to highlight and focus on. And we're going to talk about some of the materials and resources that we've developed over the years to really focus on some of those, some of those efforts. We have developed quite a few resources, um, and those can be found on our website at www.hate.info. I love this slide, this picture of all our uh, beautiful members of our Women's HIV Research Collaborative. So a lot of the work that we do at Hank functions through working groups. And these working groups, this is just one example of a working group that is focused on the representation of cisgender and transgender women in HIV clinical trials. And most of the work that Hank has done that is cure specific has been through the WHRC, or Women's HIV HIV Research Collaborative. Um, just some examples, uh, back to 2016, we have a three-part webinar series that is focused on the overall HIV cure landscape uh, for cis and trans women. We have a training um, that has been updated through 2021 um, that is community-focused. So the intent is to make this slide set and training available to community members who are interested in um, and getting more information to communities about women's representation in HIV cure clinical research. And we have ongoing work as well um, with the meaningful involvement of cis and trans women in HIV clinical um, cure research as well. So just wanted to kind of give this example of one of our working groups and show you the beautiful faces of our working group members. Um, our co-chairs there are our front and center, Dazon Dixon Diallo and Dr. Tiffany Dyer as well, so you may know some of them and some of these other faces too. This is, uh, so everything else is not cure specific, but can be applied to the field of HIV cure related research. And this is one example that everyone in this room can use as an advocacy tool for HIV cure research or any other type of actually clinical trial whatsoever. It doesn't even need to be um, HIV specific. This is an initiative called the Representative Studies Rubric, and it's a tool that um, we designed at Hank, the Hank Legacy Project, to address this ongoing legacy of underrepresentation of particular populations. 
Uh, we've been working on this issue for a long time in legacy and releasing guidance documents, trainings, uh, working across our clinical trials networks with CABs, focused on um, specifically these populations. You know, we have underrepresented groups in terms of age, drug use, ethnicity, gender, pregnancy, race, and sex assigned at birth. So, you know, you think about in the United States, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you think about women, all transgender people, people who inject drugs, youth. These are the populations that are still underrepresented in HIV clinical trials and yet overrepresented in the HIV epidemic. So what we wanted to do, because oftentimes there's this notion that these are hard to reach populations. And, you know, there is, I think, some um, something to be said about preparing communities to participate in clinical trials, you know, making sure that everyone has access to information about research. But there's also a different side to this problem of underrepresentation, which is our own research process. What are the, the barriers that have been perpetuated over time in our systems, our medical systems, our institutions that contribute to this problem of underrepresentation? So what we did with this project is we thought through, through community consultations with our various working groups, what are the um, ongoing problems of underrepresentation and how can we make a checklist that researchers can use to check off, are we thinking about this population? Are we thinking about this method of inclusion? And this um, tool ended up being a 12 item questionnaire. So there's 12 questions that we would like researchers to use um, and ask of every clinical trial that is being designed in our HIV research networks, our four networks. I'm very happy to say that all four networks have taken this tool up and are currently uh, thinking through ways to implement this tool in protocol development. And what you can do in terms of advocacy is you can check this out on our website, the full questionnaire is available and CABs can use this, uh, researchers can use this as an advocacy tool to make sure that these questions of representation are asked at every single clinical trial um, that we're conducting across the networks. So that's the RSR. Should we pause for any questions? I don't want it to just all be us talking, yeah. So I'm just wondering the Women's HIV Research Group, um, do, does that group also feel like maternal um, the pregnancy and the maternal related issues around HIV cure. Um, not HIV cure specifically, but broad, more broadly, um, pregnancy, lactation, inclusion of people who are pregnant in clinical trials overall is a major focus of the WHRC. Yeah. And the IMPACT network in particular, um, was it last year or the year before, IMPACT and WHO released this really um, powerful statement and call to action about inclusion of pregnant and breast or chest feeding people in um, in all clinical trials and HIV specifically. So we're promoting that and getting more concrete with those uh, recommendations as well. When you talk about uh, hard to reach populations and the researchers role in what role they played in that, um, could you give some examples of what those are? Yeah, I thought people might ask, so I did include some more slides <laughs> on that. Um, maybe we'll get to the end. I'll let Russell kind of talk more about some of these resources, but we'll come back and talk about these, you know, what are these 12 items on this RSR questionnaire? You know, uh, for example, um, one of them that has been implemented starting, I believe, with the HPTN is this idea of an enrollment goal. So in HPTN 083 was one of the first trials to write into the protocol uh, that 10% of the overall study population should be transgender women and at least 50% of the United States population in the trial should be um, young African-American men who have sex with men. And so what we're recommending is that all trials think about enrollment goals for underrepresented populations to make sure that our trials are representative of the epidemic and of the research question being asked. So that's just one example, but we can talk more about that. Um, I've got some slides a little bit later on. So we'll just move on. And we want definitely want to make sure we allow enough time for uh, more questions. 
So this was a document that uh, initially was developed several years ago, and then we updated it back in 2020. It's just, these are recommendations for community engagement. Um, this document wouldn't be possible without our amazing colleague, uh, Ron Siskin at the Division of AIDS. And I know Gail has also worked on the updates for this. Um, and it basically just provides guidance and recommendations for um, CABs uh, and site staff. And uh, that's available on our website. And, you know, it goes into just when we think about community engagement, some of the things that are just another tool that, that makes it uh, to, to help us along the, the way. Um, something I want to give uh, a shout out to, uh, once again, uh, Dr. Jeff Shelton, who uh, developed this uh, document, How to Qu Critically and Quickly Read a P Protocol. He, it was originally developed uh, for ACTG, and he was generous enough to, oh, thank you. Okay, he was uh, generous enough to uh, take this and revise it so that it's something that could be used across the networks. Um, and basically it outlines and explains most the most important co components of what to look for in a study protocol and really empowers cabs and communities to advocate for themselves and it's available in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And I just confirmed with him just before I came up here um, that a few years ago there was a conversation about if you would be willing to take this and adapt it for cure um, protocols. And he said, in fact, he would do that. So I just want to put that out there if there's interest in that. So um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to add to that, but but yeah, so just something to keep in mind. Okay. I would say that we also talked about, spoke on the informed consent process. Yeah. That's part of that. Yeah. yeah, I think there's also a good suggestion that we look at the informed consent process it is a process and elaborate on that program. Thank you. And along those lines, we have uh, uh, done webinars on the informed consent process, and we do have some uh, trainings on the informed consent process. So the next item I wanted to note, uh, this is, again, I'm going to shout out uh, to Gail, who was one of the key folks, as well as uh, our, some of our PTN colleagues who were um, instrumental in developing this Bill of Rights and Responsibilities for HIV Research. Um, yesterday, I just I was at a, uh, a local hospital uh, and I was at a, a check-in and the person was doing their thing and I looked over to the left and I saw uh, they had on the, um, in a frame, their uh, patient uh, rights and responsibilities. And it occurred to me, I thought, I wonder how many people take a look at that. And it was there and it was you know, it was really cool and, I, and it made me think of this because that was why this was developed, um, not to replace informed consent, going back to what Jeff just talked about, but just to really highlight what are the roles and responsibilities for participants. And it outlines the same thing for uh, research uh, staff. And so um, I think it was probably about a month and a half ago that Gail reached out to me to ask if we had one uh, for, for TV. And I said, no, we didn't. So I reached out to our uh, colleagues over at the TBTC Crag to ask, and they said they didn't, but we are now working with them on developing and, and modifying this one for, uh, that, that we use for HIV for TV. So, so stay tuned for that. And again, this goes back to um, doing what we can to make it easier for participants and individuals to understand what they're participating in um, in, in these clinical trials. This is something that, uh, this mentorship program is something that came about. I think all of you recognize that COVID just really, uh, you know, wreaked havoc. We had a lot of uh, staff turnover, a lot of disruption. So we had folks who just completely, you know, just left their positions. We had site staff who were suddenly put in positions to support uh, CABs and they had no experience and they, were asking for help, saying it would be great to have someone I could reach out to to talk to about how to run a cab, how to develop agenda. So we have put together this program of uh, this mentorship program where we have uh, identified individuals from around the world who have agreed to serve as mentors to help uh, these individuals in these positions who are new, who are looking for guidance. And so that's something that we are 
launching and, and getting off the, off the ground. So just wanted to highlight that as one of the programs. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Red Ribbon Register? Okay, a few of you. <laughs> okay, I was hand way up. Um, so the Red Ribbon Registry, uh, as you see, is a database that connects potential study participants with local clinic sites to make sure that folks uh, who want to participate in clinical trials can have access to, to that. Um, this came about from uh, COVID, the, the COVID and they had a database similar to this. So we now have one uh, for HIV. Our role in that is to make sure that the networks who want to participate in this have the, the knowledge that they need, make sure they have the connections, and to bring them on board. So we are doing that. We are currently working with ACTG. Um, we just had a call recently with uh, the HBTN. And so I just wanted you all to be aware of this. Uh, there's the website. And just to keep this in mind, because, it, you know, it, uh, Gail, do you remember how many folks uh, were on the COVP and the registry? Over 700,000. Yeah, a lot of people. So just think of the potential um, that we could have uh, with the Red Ribbon Registry. So we are actively involved in this in terms of uh, Hank staff. Um, let's see here. One pause. Jessica. Are you just looking at um, like clinical study? I mean, who are the external partners that? Are able to help sign people up. Who are the external partners? Yeah, I'm just, you know, are people just going to the red, red registry and signing up, or mm -hmm. are, are you doing any engagement with external community partners? And just putting on my MDC hat, um, is that something like would you want the MDCs to do as part of their engagement outreach? Good question. So we, you know, what we haven't gotten that far. So currently. That's, we can have that conversation. Um, right now, we have just been focused on uh, the four networks, but we can certainly have that conversation. Um, you know, the so what you do is you go into the registry, you, you register, you put all your information in, and that information is there. Uh, studies, uh, sites can say, oh, this person is here. I can connect with them. Gail has her hand up. The way it's designed right now, um, this is a, a project that the HBTN began, um, as, as Russell said, to allow for COVID experience. Um, people go in and they complete a, a pretty detailed survey questionnaire that gets at their health, um, it includes HIV status, it includes medications you may be using, uh, either treatment or prevention. Um, and basically, you're data that is sitting in this registry. Um, and as Russell said, at the moment, this is something that is only designed to be used by the four uh, dates networks. That's where our funding for the project lives. Um, our partner in building all of this and managing it is um, Oracle, not your host. Um, and so they help kind of manage the back end programming of it. Um, but once you know, so for example, in the HBTN where we're actually using it, when we have a new study that opens, um, our team goes in, sets up that study in the registry, and it filters the data in the registry by the eligibility criteria for that study. So that a clinical trial site that is actually participating in that study can now go in and go, okay, there's, you know, 45 people in our local catchment area that have met sort of the preliminary eligibility criteria, we can now reach out to them and you know, tell you know, talk to them about whatever study is worth rolling, see if we bring them in for some screening if they're interested in, and kind of take it from there. It's really meant to just kind of give sites a boost in, in being able to identify a set of potentially eligible folk um, and, and do some of that kind of pre-screening. Uh, step. Um, you know, obviously, the site staff are going to have to do a more specific set of study eligibility assessment and, and so on. Um, and the, the, if you go to the website that Russell's put there, um, you can see the sort of um, marketing campaign that exists around it is, is referred to as Health and HIV and the fact that it takes all of us. 
um, that is not specific to HIV status in any way. It's trying to position HIV and destigmatize HIV, but it just as it took all of us to find COVID vaccines and other kinds of treatments for COVID, um, and prevention for COVID, it, it's similar. We will take an entire all of us working together on the chain. Thank you, Melinda. I appreciate that. And, and I wanted to add to this is really loud, um, that currently we are in the process of working with the ACTG. They're providing us with messaging that they would like to have on the website because one of the the criticisms we keep getting here is that this is very vaccine specific and, and there was a reason for that but we're changing that and, and ACTG wants to make it clear that they do you know so this is not just for folks this is for you know people living with HIV we're, we're you know there's going to be a focus around cure all of that on the, the website once we get that uh messaging from them you'll see that reflected on the website so so stay tuned for that. It will it will change in appearance. So I just but I just I did want to let you all know for those of you who are not familiar that this is something that we are uh, we are involved in. So uh, this is just just wanted to again um, highlight we have uh, a lot of webinars that we that we host um, and we collaborate with others on. And this if you go to our our, our, our black webinar library, you'll see some of these. Um, webinars, you can access all of them there. Um, and we're, we are always looking for other topics to, to highlight. So if you want to approach us and, you know, co-collaborate or collaborate on um, and, and co-host a webinar, we're happy to do that. So, and I know we've done that with NMAC and we, we have some plans to do more of that. So, so certainly something we're happy to do again, to do what we can to promote any of your work and address any issues that you feel are pressing. I think that's better. Yeah, it's going to be better. Um, yeah, just kind of a collage of things to wrap things up here in terms of our resources that we have available. Uh, you know, we're involved in a lot of different things. And I think just kind of the overall message that um, we're happy to, you know, to, to uh, preach here today with all of you is collaboration, as Russell was just saying. You know, a lot of, a lot of the HIV cure clinical research right now is limited. Um, you know, there's a lot of basic science happening with HIV cure, and some might say that that's not really a time for community engagement. We don't share in that belief. We think it's the perfect time to engage with community and to um, develop new relationships and collaborations. So I just wanted to say that, and here's some examples of other things that we're involved with, publications on transgender representation. Um, we have a new infographic coming out uh, very soon for National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day which is on March 10th. So we'll have a new one. This was last year's. Uh, Pedro, who's in the room, manages the H equals H podcast. That stands for the H is for human. Um, it's a great podcast with now 11 episodes um, that are available on the Hank website. That's hank.info. Um, Be the Generation is a biomedical aging prevention campaign uh, that many may be familiar with and is still ongoing, managed through our office. So lots of different resources and ways to get involved uh, with Hank. Oh, there's one on top too that's good to point out, the long acting injectable machine that we have. So really, you know, cutting across all different types of HIV clinical trials, uh, research, inclusive of cure. I would say our current involvement in HIV cure related research is also somewhat limited, but we would really like to get more involved and support activities that you all have going on to learn more and to really engage in that meaningful collaboration. So um, let's continue to do that. Okay, thank you. And, and I just wanted to add too that, you know, we have, um, there's a group community partners, which is a group that's comprised of um, global uh, cab members from each of the networks. And often during um, our CP calls, you know, we talk about the importance of CP. We also talk about this as part of legacy as well. We talk about those communities that are disproportionately impacted by HIV. You know, I grew up uh, in the port of Panhandle. Um, I was just there well, recently, but I was back in, de in there in December. And this is part of uh, HBCU engagement work. And when we're talking to HBCU students, you know, even if you're talking about you equals you, Students don't, that's, that's a new concept for them. I know it's something that we talk about often, but you equals you 
analytic treatment interruption. Those are things that when we present them, they, they're hearing about them for the first time. So when we talk about community engagement, we're like starting from, from scratch. It's like, these are things that are new to people and they're important to know. And so we're not talking down to people. We're just introducing these things that are important to these communities where they, there's a high incidence of HIV. So we have to think about that. So, you know, whether I'm in Tallahassee or whether I'm maybe, you know, a township, it, it's getting that information to people and understanding that what we know it, you know, it's information that folks don't have and that they're, they're happy to have it, but we have to, we have to keep in mind that there are communities that don't have access to this information. So when we talk about community patients, like, what do people know and what's going to be most useful for you? And so that's certainly something we do as part of our working groups. I just wanted to add that. So thank you. And we will open it up for questions. Cool. Um, I had a question just uh, I know with the last iteration of the MBCs, we were going to have members of the MBC cab join CP, but because there's really no through line, I know that kind of fell over because we had the read competition. Is that a potential to have that happen again with, you know, one or two MBC cab members joining CP? Yeah, we can certainly do that. So if you want to, um, Michael, if you want to contact sure. me and um, Greg Davis is now facilitating the CP. Um, Working with contact okay. me. Great. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to ask because the question came up earlier in the context of peer research, whether you mentioned uh, the project you've been doing about uh, the representation of campaign doing against diverse people in, in Asian groups and more broadly. Yeah, no, great question. Um, the RSR can speak to that as well, but I also I was thinking about this on my walk over how, uh, you know, I was talking about the way that it's HIV Research Collaborative. And I, I mentioned it, but I want to emphasize too that the way that the WHRC defines women is inclusive of transgender people. And also, you know, we bring along everybody um, when we talk about the WHRC, it's focused on more than women, but you know, we bring everybody along in this. So the other thing I was thinking is when we say transgender people, sometimes we mean transgender women. And um, we recently in partnership with ABAP released um, some findings from a, uh, a landscape analysis from 1991 to current milestone HIV clinical trials that showed that uh, less than 1% of participants in these milestone studies from 91 to now, less than 1% of the participants in those trials were transgender people. And of that less than 1%, 94% were transgender women. So we still have a major problem with the representation of transgender men and gender non-binary people. So I wanted to enter that into the conversation, and uh, the, as part of that analysis we did, we also have an extension of the RSR that I was talking about that focuses specifically on transgender populations and has seven different indicators. Uh, we're calling it a scorecard. We're going to release um, later on this year what exactly is in our scorecard, um, but those are the indicators that are trans-specific as well. And when we say trans, we mean trans women, trans men, and gender non-binary people and all um, fall within the transgender umbrella. I also I was wondering if it might be possible to create something similar to the Red River Registry, but for people that might be interested in joining a camp, and I'm not quite sure like where to go if they're interested in ICTG or or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we so there is there there is a doc there is a, um, a document actually we have it on our on the hate website that has a list of the various cabs of different groups and so you can find that there. So yeah, that is there. I didn't I should have put that up there on the slide, but yes, there that is there. So it does it does capture all of that. And we um that was just I think it was probably about five months ago that that was out. So it's pretty recent. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we should share the name. Yeah. Other questions? Jeff. Maybe Brian, you can comment a little bit on his work on HIV criminalization and transmission and gene sequencing, which is very relevant to peer research. There have been cases of transmission in people in ATI studies, and, and it's very relevant. I think we can talk a little bit about this work. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is one I, I mean, we could talk for a long time about this and it's so nerdy. Um, so if anyone wants to really get into the weeds about uh, genetics and, you know, HIV surveillance and what the epidemiology, let's definitely do that. I would love to have um, partners in your meeting on that. <laughs> but um, yeah, basically, you know, I mentioned the um, opposites of track study earlier. So that was a study of, I think it was 600 or uh, 343 couples cisgender female couples, and I believe that was Australia, Brazil, and Thailand as well. And uh, that was the first study of the major uh, partner studies that were uh, generating this data leading up to U equals U that really thought intentionally about the issue of HIV criminalization. Um, globally and including in the United States, there are many jurisdictions that continue to criminalize having HIV. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's not even um, the intentional transmission of HIV to somebody else, but it's just the aspect of having HIV that is criminalized. If you actually look at the laws, um, in most of the HIV criminal cases that have gone to court, HIV transmission has not even occurred. It's just uh, one partner claiming that the other partner did not disclose their HIV status. So it's just a simple fact of having HIV that is being criminalized. In that context, you know, we're operating these clinical trials where we're asking people to go off of therapy or <coughs> partner studies where we have zero different partners. So HIV criminalization is part of the context in which we're conducting these clinical trials and is a risk to participants. If we're increasing that risk of criminalization, that's something that needs to be factored in to the clinical trial. And so Opposites Attract is a study that did that. Um, we published a paper with Liza Dawson on uh, recommendations for phylogenetic um, HIV studies, where they're actually genetically sequencing the HIV and monitoring the transmission patterns, comparing people's HIV genetic sequences to each other. And uh, we wrote this paper with Liza Dawson and many other collaborators giving recommendations on the legal environment, but also data privacy, many other factors uh, related to this really uh, unique and important issue. So if you Google um, my name and phylogenetics, you'll find that <laughs> in a couple other papers. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all there. <laughs> I just wanted, oh yeah, these are the questions back to Bill's. So these are the 12 um, kind of summarized points that are on the RSR. So you can kind of peruse those. And uh, if anybody else has questions, we take those. I'm not gonna run to you tonight I'm just gonna make my way to the city of light